Okay, thank you, uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you for to Chris Ham for uh, the loan of the uh, King's Fund's uh, meeting rooms and services this afternoon. Um, uh, for those who uh, don't know me, I'm uh, Steve Field. I'm a GP in Central Birmingham, and uh, stood down from chairing the Royal College of GPs in November of last year, and uh, been asked to chair this future forum. Uh, so we've been working on this over the last eight weeks. Um, uh, across the uh, table here, um, from the end, we've got Jeff Oldtimes, Chief Executive of uh, Fulham and Hammersmith Council. Um, Cathy McLean, who's uh, Medical Director at uh, East Midlands SHA. Julie Moore, who is a uh, nurse by background and Chief Executive of University Hospital Birmingham. And Stephen Bubb, who is the Chief Executive of Akibo. Uh, which is the third sector chief executives organization. Um, thank you for coming. This is a, an important day uh, for us and we believe an important day for the NHS. We believe that our report, which uh, you will uh, undoubtedly have time to read uh, later on, uh, will, uh, we believe, if implemented by the government, make a, a very important um, stride, uh, step forward for the NHS so the NHS can move forward um, from its current state where um, over the last few months it feels to us as we've been out there around the uh, country uh, that there's been a bit of paralysis in there, uh, a lot of fear and a lot of concerns and we believe this report will helpfully uh, help the NHS move forward. What I'm planning to do is talk you through some of the key findings and the recommendations and then open up for questions and answers. Uh, this first slide is uh, symbolic in that everything we've been doing, we've rooted in the uh, NHS constitution. And I wanted, before we started, uh, just to read out so that we all understand where we are coming from about the NHS. Because the NHS is in the fabric of our society. Uh, it is quite uh, unique in the United Kingdom, particularly in England where we've been uh, meeting and talking and listening over the last eight weeks, how much people value our National Health Service. It really is part of something we all uh, believe in. So the NHS belongs to the people. It's there to improve our health and well-being, supporting us to keep mentally and physically well, to get better when we're ill and when we're, we cannot fully recover, to stay as well as we can to the end of our lives. It works at the limits of science, bringing the highest levels of human knowledge and skill to save lives and improve health. It touches our lives at times of basic human need when care and compassion are what matter both, most. We uh, all believe passionately in the NHS. The NHS has been there for me, uh, for my family, uh, through uh, illness over many, many years, getting us back on our feet. Uh, it's been there for many people over 60 years now, and we believe the NHS should continue as a national health service, providing care of the highest possible quality to all of the citizens of England, uh, wherever they live, uh, wherever they work. But the NHS can't stand still. What we've been hearing over the last eight weeks is that the NHS does need to change. It does need to move forward. The elderly population, uh, as people get older, they have more and more conditions all at the same time. As a GP, I know that. I've got patients who are alive now who wouldn't have been alive years ago and into their 30s and 40s with cystic fibrosis. We've got leaders of pathfinders who've had heart transplants who, because of the successes in the NHS, have actually been able to provide uh, fantastic leadership over the years. But all of this comes at a tremendous cost. And unless we uh, improve the productivity in the NHS, unless we integrate our care much better, much more effectively with social care, unless we focus on prevention, the NHS uh, cannot survive in its current comprehensive state. So uh, change uh, has to happen. And as they say, resistance uh, is futile because we have to take that forward. We believe that the government's stated aim of making improvements in the quality of healthcare and improving healthcare outcomes uh, is universally supported from uh, everyone that we've heard 
no one has really argued about the issue about improving outcomes and improving quality. But we have heard a lot of genuine and deep-seated concerns from staff, from patients and from the public. We've actually had over 25,000 uh, emails uh, in to us. We've met with over 6,500 people. We've held thousands of meetings across the country. Uh, we believe we've got a pretty good idea of what people are, are concerned about and we've taken lots of ideas uh, on board uh, from them. The declaration of no decision uh, about me, without me, has to be hardwired into every part of the system. We've been getting lots of really good feedback about the principles in the bill, the patient-focused, patient-centred, patient-empoweredness, the clinical leadership. Um, we've had a lot of very supportive feedback about the public health focus, tackling health inequalities. But services must change. There must be an increasing focus, not just on the individual, but on local populations. In order to improve care, we need to look across local populations. We need to look at the risk across those populations and provide the sort of interventions that are needed to keep people healthy, rather than just having to patch people up when it's too late. And we've heard very strongly that clinical leadership is important and the way forward is with clinical leaders supported by high quality managers and I'll say quite a bit in a while about managers. Uh, we've heard that um, people believe that it's right that GPs should take responsibility for the health of their population. As a GP I work in an inner city area I really do have a good understanding of our multi-ethnic deprived population and how we can improve care in that microcosm that's in inner city Birmingham. But I also believe and we've heard from uh, the many thousands of people we've met, that GPs shouldn't do it uh, on their own, on our own. And relevant multi-professional advice in designing healthcare is essential. We've also heard a lot about competition. Um, we do believe that there's a very good place for competition in the English National Health Service. But that uh, should be as a tool for supporting choice, promoting integration, and improving quality. It should never be used as an end in itself. And for that, and I'll say a bit more about Monitor in a few minutes, the main duty of Monitor in exercising its functions, if you read part three of the bill, is to protect and promote the interest of people who use the health services. We believe very strongly, however, that its primary duty beneath that uh, to promote competition should be removed. And we, should, we think we should... Uh, ask the government to insert a new clause which should be about requiring Monitor to support choice, collaboration and integration. And that is the overwhelming view of people we've met, whether they're patients in inner cities or rural areas, whether they're doctors or nurses or organisations that have contacted us. And clinical leaders, managers and all those who care about the success of our NHS agree that quality, safety and meeting the financial challenge must take primacy and the pace of transition to any new system uh, should reflect this. And we'll talk in a few minutes about the fact that this is evolutionary and sometimes we need to speed up change and sometimes we need to recognise that people don't always go at the same speed of the fastest. So what I'm going to do now is just talk you through the key recommendations just as a, a, a way uh, of a taster before we uh, can interact more fully with questions and answers. <coughs> so everything that we've done, everything we've heard, has been based on the enduring values of the NHS. And the fact the NHS constitution uh, gives rights to patients, gives rights to staff, which are universally supported. So we're going to say, and we've said in our paper that we gave to the Prime Minister uh, two hours ago, that the bill should be amended to place a new duty on the commissioning board and the commissioning consortia to actively promote the NHS constitution. We believe that's really important because patients and staff will then know more clearly what their rights and responsibilities are. And in there, there's a whole section on choice, being able to choose your GP. For staff, there are important rights and responsibilities which were negotiated 
with the unions just two years ago. And because we're going to put that in, we are going to ask, monitor the CQC, the Commissioning Board, etc., to all show, uh, show the NHS uh, and Parliament every year um, how they've taken regard to the Constitution. We all believe in the NHS. Those rights, uh, the values, the beliefs are central to everything that we do. We also heard a lot about, of concerns about the Secretary of State's uh, responsibility for the NHS, and there was a lot of misunderstanding out there. Um, and the more people had read the bill, the more people became um, uh, unsure of what the Secretary of State's responsibility uh, should be. So we're saying that the NHS should be freed from day-to-day -day political interference, but the Secretary of State must remain ultimately accountable for the NHS. So we, we've asked the government to make the bill clearer so that people out there can understand. We've heard a lot from patients and carers about the, the fact that they want to be equal partners with health professionals, but also citizens in populations wanting to get more engaged in how they design their local health service. And we uh, support that, but we don't want it to continue as it has done in many areas to be tokenistic or paternalistic. In every consultation I have with a GP, I don't always succeed, but I strive to have uh, a joint um, arrangement where we're making a joint decision, they're getting choice over what sort of treatment they should have, but it's really a partnership between me as a doctor, uh, them as a patient, and, and when we start to look at commissioning decisions, these decisions should be done with the public, joint decisions, real shared decision making. And because the NHS belongs to the people, we also believe that everything we do in the NHS should be transparent. So we do believe that commissioning consortia should have a governing body. That wasn't universally agreed if you follow back over the last eight or ten weeks, uh, where many pathfinders are encouraging uh, different ways of doing things. We need to support that. But because this is NHS money, they should have a governing body, they should meet in public, there should be effective independent representation to protect against conflicts of interests, and the members should abide by Nolan principles of public life. Uh, we also believe that NHS funded services, so the providers of these services, including uh, foundation trusts, should have uh, their board meetings in public, and they should publish uh, their board papers. And something that came up late in the exercise was a concern about foundation trusts and how they were going through what's um, called the foundation trust pipeline so that they had enough support to get to the point where they could become foundation trusts. And one of the areas I'd not thought about until right up to the last couple of days was Monitor's compliance role in making sure foundation trusts were fit for purpose. And we are going to say something about the fact that um, governors can't take on the responsibility of overseeing foundation trusts until they have the appropriate knowledges and, knowledge and skills. And that's a really important governance uh, issue. We've met with uh, countless numbers of professional groups, individuals, and heard a lot on, on email, uh, as well as uh, telephone calls at all times of day and night about the role of health professionals in commissioning. Uh, we do believe that GPs leading and taking responsibility for their local population is important, but be we believe all of the professions should be involved and engaged uh, in helping design local health services, and we do think that a, a larger group collectively called a clinical senate could be a useful uh, addition by providing um, expert support to clinical networks, uh, to local design of services across more than one consortia but linked to the Health and Wellbeing Board. We've been alarmed um, at uh, many meetings about how uh, demoralised managers have been uh, over the last few months. Um, we've been very concerned uh, at what we've heard about how they feel marginalised, unloved, and many of the good ones are fleeing the NHS very rapidly or taking early retirement. Uh, we believe very, very strongly 
And as a doctor, I can say this very strongly, that managers have a critical role uh, to play in working with and supporting clinicians and clinical leaders. We've got to do something very quickly uh, so that we don't lose experienced managers. We need them in, in order to get a smooth transfer through to the new system, uh, but also to tackle what um, Stephen Doyle calls the Nicholson challenge, the quip challenge of trying to manage the financial situation uh, as it is. Uh, we've heard very strongly that um, commissioning consortia uh, are a good idea, uh, that putting clinicians in charge of making decisions locally about their health service is good with appropriate patient uh, input and public input, but it, the system should be comprehensive. Uh, all GPs uh, should be, all their practices should be part of commissioning consortia. Um, we also heard a lot of concerns about the pace of change. Uh, we do think uh, that they should all move towards being accredited uh, as consortia. We don't think there should be an opt-out. But the April uh, 13 date might be too onerous for some. We believe that some, like in Cambridge, who are taking responsibility for their finances, should be encouraged to pilot and move forward even in advance of April 13, so that we can all learn the lessons. Um, but we don't think they, uh, people should be uh, having a, a rigid black and white cutoff. But the NHS Commissioning Board, on the other hand, should be doing everything it can to get them approved as speedily as possible, um, so that there's no misunderstanding. This is the direction of travel. Uh, we heard a lot about patient uh, choice and um, Stephen was leading on, on this area and I'm sure he'll talk later uh, about this. We do believe there's a real um, role for um, uh, choice. Patients want choice uh, and we're going to promote something called the choice mandate which will be in the papers that you, you read and take the... Um, NHS Commissioning Board will be held to account for that and as you'll see I think there are seven areas which include making a market if it's appropriate, encouraging a market and encouraging um, that but also addressing health inequalities. Um, I, I think you'll find that area very very interesting as well as the citizens panel um, which is going to be part of Health Watch England if the government agree. Uh, and this right to challenge, so that if you're in a rural area and your hospital is not providing the services that you believe perhaps it should do as a group of citizens, um, you could have the challenge on the commissioners in order to look at what sort of choice might be available. Now this is part of what's in the localism bill at the moment. We think a lot more work needs to be done on it, but the principle of giving patients, giving citizens, local populations more control over their health care we believe is a good idea. And as I said earlier, competition should not be used as a tool for, should, should not be used as an end in itself. It should be used as a tool for supporting choice, promoting integration and improving quality. We believe the English NHS uh, does uh, you know, need competition in some areas, but Monitor's role should be significantly diluted. Its primary duty to promote competition should be removed and the bill should be amended to require monitor support choice, collaboration and integration. A monitor should also not be anything to do with a utility regulator, but is a sector regulator for health, which is very, very different. And we've said quite a bit in the paper, as you'll see, about cherry-picking patients. And through monitor's role and through the commissioning board, we need to do all we can um, to avoid cherry-picking. And we've got some uh, things in the papers, as you'll see, about trying to level the playing field with private providers so that uh, they will also take responsibility for funding education and training, just like uh, NHS-funded uh, uh, bodies, um, foundation trusts, NHS trusts. The duties uh, placed on the Secretary of State regarding health inequalities we welcome. We just hope they're going to be delivered, and we're really encouraged by the government's support both in public and behind the scenes for uh, reducing health inequalities and the health inclusion uh, debate. 
And one of the key things at a local level that uh, Jeff's been leading on is around health and well-being boards. We believe that they uh, should become the generators of health and social care integration, um, focusing on the needs of local populations, vulnerable people. We want them to have stronger powers to look at the commissioning plans of local commissioning groups, but also what the commissioning board is commissioning for local areas as well. And integration is one of the key themes, as if you read all five of the papers. Uh, integration of care around the needs of the patient, at a micro level, how we work in our practice with our local health visitors, with social care, with our local population. Um, you might have seen David Cameron, uh, who visited and stayed overnight in one of our uh, local uh, places in the city of Birmingham before the election. Uh, this is about local communities taking more control and about commissioning we can do that between health and social care and to do that we don't think uh, having consortia crossing lots of local authority boundaries is a good thing um, we don't believe coterminosity of um, consortia with local authorities is achievable because if you go back to local authority boundaries in 1974 and since some of them still don't make complete sense when you look at the health uh, configurations and vice versa. But we don't think consortia should cross the local authority boundaries unless there's a clear justification. That will encourage people to do things for their local population, health and social care. We also want to encourage some pilot sites for that and make sure that places like Torbay and Hereford are encouraged to move forward. Julie's been leading on this uh, big area of education and training and the summary uh, for that really falls into to two areas. The, the workforce paper needs more work uh, and we need to really take more time over working out how the education and training and workforce issues are delivered and that's about multidisciplinary interprofessional systems. It's about making sure there's a home for the deaneries in the short term and then having a bigger debate later. But one of the areas I've been particularly concerned about going around the country is how um, variable the professional development support is for the staff. This is in the NHS constitution. We've met some staff who say to us that they've not had any professional development for getting on for 30 years, and we think that's disgraceful. Uh, if you look at industry, they publish how much money they've put into CPD and development of staff and training in many uh, uh, parts of industry. In our NHS, it varies between directorates within hospitals and within hospitals, and is hugely variable in general practice and in dentistry and pharmacy and elsewhere. And in every meeting I've been at where we've talked about development, it's been raised as a concern. So we're going to ask the National Quality Board to do an urgent piece of work to look how, on how that can be improved. We've had a lot of input from people from the public health world, but um, public health isn't just about public health doctors, public health specialists. The public's health is everybody's uh, business. And um, there are two uh, key things I want to say now, but there's more in the paper. One is in order to protect the population of England, uh, everyone who provides or... Can Hmm, interesting. <laughs> there must be the public health god up there saying something. Uh, everybody who's engaged in public health, uh, whether it's a provider or a commissioner, needs to have a duty to cooperate uh, so that they can all pull together in a state of emergency or infection. And we're also concerned that Public Health England uh, is going to be um, established within and part of the Department of Health. Uh, we think it needs an independent uh, voice, and we're encouraging and advising the government to consider setting it up uh, as an arm's length body or at least not within the Department of Health. There are different models you could do that. Clinical leaders and managers finally have all said that uh, they believe in the NHS. Uh, they're worried about the success of the NHS because this pause in some areas has uh, meant that some have been um, not having to move forward. Some have been moving forward. Some have been frozen waiting for the outcomes. They don't want lots of time in the future. Uh, they want to move forward to make sure that they meet the financial challenge. 
At a local level, they want to focus on quality, safety and the financial challenge. And at the national level, it's the same. So for that to happen, we need the commissioning board to be established. But we also need some more certainty about the NHS at local level, which is why we believe the government um, should accept our recommendations, uh, should amend the bill appropriately. And we look forward uh, to their response uh, tomorrow, uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, and um, we look forward then to working with them in whichever way they want us to do. We don't believe that this is an issue um, that is uh, meant to be a political football. Uh, we believe that the time for political argument is coming to the end. Uh, we believe the listening exercise has been successful, the feedback has been hugely supportive. But now we urge politicians to work together uh, to take the NHS forward for the good of patients. And if we can do that, uh, this will be a victory for our patients, uh, for the public and for the staff of the NHS. Uh, and we believe that this is a golden opportunity for the NHS to really create a new vision uh, for the future, to meet the challenges of the elderly population, of the comorbidities, of the financial situation. And uh, we need to move forward uh, quickly. Um, so thank you for that. And we'll now take some questions.